Let I have the, the honorable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, more and more Quebecers are realizing that voting for the bloc comes with a cost. On two occasions, they voted in favor of maintaining two carbon taxes, one which has a direct impact on Quebec and the second carbon tax, which will cost up to 20 cents more uh, per litre of gasoline. But that's not all, Mr. Speaker. Monday, at the Ethics Committee, the RCMP Commissioner was there, ready to testify on the SNC-Lavalin affair. And before he could even speak, the Liberal members of the committee asked that the meeting be adjourned. And who voted in favour of that with the Liberals? The Bloc Québécois. Yes, the Bloc Québécois. The Bloc uh, Québécois, a member for Trois-Rivières, is preventing the RCMP boss from speaking. He was there. In the committee room, how can the Bloc Québécois side with the Liberals when it comes to ethics? How can the Bloc side with the Liberal government when it comes to protecting the Prime Minister? Whether it's uh, for your wallet or for ethics, it costs a lot to vote Bloc. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, members of the NDP Liberal government shut down the Ethics Committee before we could hear from the RCMP Commissioner, who was there to testify about the documents that that Liberal Prime Minister refused to release that hindered their criminal investigation into the SNC-Lavalin scandal. All of this happened after that Prime Minister hid behind Cabinet confidence. This type of behaviour is, di is disgraceful and surely clear, sh shows clearly that the Liberals, with the help of the NDP, seem to be hiding and protecting that Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, no one, not even the Prime Minister, should be above the law. Here, here, here. After eight years, this corrupt NDP Liberal government has not only worsened the livelihoods of Canadians, but has seen trust in government disappear as quickly as a Liberal election promise. <laughs> Canadians deserve to know that if that Prime Minister broke the law to help his friends. So my question is simple. If he has nothing to hide, why is the cover-up coalition going to such lengths to keep the facts from coming to light? Yeah. Bravo. 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 The, the Honourable Member for La Salle et Verdun. Mr. Speaker, I rise today with the sad news that Canada has lost a loyal and faithful public servant. Our friend and colleague, Senator Ian Shugart, has left us after a battle with cancer. Ian was born in Ottawa and educated at Trinity College U of T before taking a degree in political economy. He cut his political teeth as a policy advisor to two right honourables, Joe Clark and Brian Mulroney. When the Conservatives were elected to govern in 1984, he first became a policy advisor and then chief of staff to Minister Jake Epp. During this time, he played a pivotal role in historic events, such as the patriation of the Constitution and the development of the Charter, and working, amongst other things, on childcare, labour market agreements and the Meech Lake Accord. In 1991, Ian entered the public service, rising to many important roles, successive deputy minister positions, with a substantive impact in many areas, including health, labour, climate and global affairs. Finally, in 2019, he was named to, by the Prime Minister to be the 24th Clerk of the Privy Council. He would serve in this role for two years, marked by the outset of a global pandemic, until his health forced him to step aside. When the situation looked more positive, Mr. Speaker, in 2022, he returned to public service as a senator and with a deserved role at the Monk School. Ian's public service was, was punctuated not only by his intellect, but by his practical wisdom. I would add, too, his civility and kindness. As a rookie cabinet minister on some challenging files, I will always appreciate the many kind words Ian, from Ian before, after, and sometimes during cabinet meetings, whether spoken or in the form of an encouraging note. Ian, on behalf of all Canadians, thank you for your dedicated service to this country and to our public institutions. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Linda, to your family and friends, please, please accept our condolences. Rest in peace, friend. He was indeed a great public servant. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona. The world is a dangerous place for women. In the DRC, women are facing the world's highest rates of sexual and gender-based violence. MSF reports that sexual violence now is a public health emergency in the Central African Republic. In Afghanistan and Iran, women's rights are non-existent. In Canada, 
Women who speak up are attacked, not just in politics, but in journalism, on social media, and in their communities. And I am alarmed by the exclusion of Muslim and Jewish women's voices from critical conversations on Israel and Palestine. Canada claims to have a feminist foreign policy, but where are the investments? As Sudan's Hala Karib said recently, only paying lip service to the women, peace and security agenda without insisting on women's rights and women's meaningful participation in peace and political processes is not enough. Canada must do better. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, St. Hubert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, we're currently witnessing a worrying rise in food insecurity and in homelessness. We're seeing a housing crisis that promises to be long and painful, and unprecedented rates of inflation that mainly affect the less fortunate, including young people in our community. In our community, Macadam Sud supports and equips young people aged 12 to 35 so that they can commit to improving their living conditions with respect and human dignity. They especially help those who find themselves on the margins of school, family, and the job market. Today, I'd like to mark the 40th anniversary of this institution. That's 40 years of supporting the community, 40 years of enabling uh, young people to live in dignity, 40 years of having a major impact for all families in Longueuil. On behalf of myself, on behalf of all members of the Bloc Québécois, thank you, Macadam Sud. The Alma member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, too many Canadians are suffering at the hands of crippling mortgage rates. According to a CBC article published this week, a Calgary senior sold his home due to interest rate hikes and is still unable to find an affordable rental. Seniors are forced to couch surf, find roommates, or get bedroom and basement apartments. Under the NDP Liberal government, this very, this very, very people who built this country are being forced to sell their homes with nowhere to turn except the workforce. Seniors should not be forced out of retirement to make ends meet and achieve their dreams of owning a home. It is clear that this NDP Liberal government is not capable of ensuring housing stability and protecting Canadians of all ages. The thousands of Canadians fighting homelessness and desperate for a change. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. It is time for Canadians to have a common sense government that brings down inflation and interest rates so hard working people can keep their homes and a secure life. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Gatineau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is a very heady day in this House as we honour a true trailblazer. Thirty years ago today, the voters of Vancouver Centre opted for a fresh alternative over her opponent, a Conservative Prime Minister. They chose a physician who is running as the Liberal candidate for the first time. Since October 25th, 1993, voters in that constituency voted Liberal, and they have elected her in 10 successive wow. yeah. elections. She is now the longest serving female Member of Parliament in Canadian history, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. She has been the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health and Secretary of State for Multiculturalism and the Status of Women. In over three decades, she has been a supporter of a strong health care system and a champion for the LGBTQ plus community. She currently chairs the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage and back home. She is beloved by her fellow residents of Vancouver. Indeed, the City of Vancouver has proclaimed a day today as a day in her name. Canada has been fortunate to have her in this House, Mr. Here, here. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years of this Prime Minister, he is not worth the cost. 
a devastating report states that in uh, that every single month there are two million people that go to food banks, the highest in Canadian history after eight years of this prime minister. Will he finally in reverse his plan to radically increase taxes on farmers, producers and truckers that deliver our food? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to answer this question in a second, but first of all, I would like to speak to Ian Sugart. That I rise in this place to mourn the loss of our friend and fellow parliamentarian, the Senator Ian Sugart. Senator Sugart, a to Senator Sugart spent all of his career serving others. His contributions were priceless. ...to this government, but I know he was also a valuable deputy minister to the leader of the opposition when he was in government. Mes plus sincères condoléances. My deepest condolences to his family, to his friends, and to his senator colleagues and his former colleagues in the public service. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My Deputy Minister, he was a brilliant public servant of both uh, serving both political parties and serving Canadians in the Senate, and all of us mourn with his family at the tragic loss of this great Canadian public servant. Um, I would like to quote the Food Bank Association. Food insecurity in Canada, so the number of people living in households that find it hard to feed themselves because of a lack of money, has increased to reach unprecedented amounts. That is after eight years of taxes and deficits from this Prime Minister. Why does the Prime Minister want to stop Canadians from having safe access to food, just to increase taxes on the backs of these very Canadians. The right honourable Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, quite the contrary over the years. We lifted 500,000 children out, out of poverty, measures that the Conservatives voted against. We helped people reach new economic goals, and we know that people are finding it hard now, and that is a reason for which we are delivering for Canadians $10 daycare, dental care for children, or increased checks for childcare benefits. And the Conservatives voted against every single time. We will continue to help families during these difficult times. We'll invest in them instead of cutting everything like the Conservatives are proposing. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Goes telling Canadians they've never had it so good when after eight years he's not worth the cost of food. According to the hunger count by the Food Banks Canada, I quote, the number of people living in households struggling to afford food due to a lack of money have increased to the highest level on record, end quote. A record smashing two million visits to Canadian food banks in a month. And his plan is to quadruple the carbon tax on the farmers and the truckers who bring us our food. How many Canadians have to go hungry or homeless before he axes this terrible tax? The right honourable prime minister. No Canadians struggling with the costs of food and groceries and housing. That's why we continue to step up to support them with measures like a ten dollar a day childcare, dental care for children, and child benefit checks. All measures that the Conservative Party has stood against, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to help Canadians. We'll continue our work to lift hundreds of thousands of kid, kids out of poverty, to lift over a million Canadians out of poverty. Uh, but there is much more to do. We will keep doing it instead of uh, giving into the Conservatives' demands for more cuts, uh, for cuts to services for Canadians, uh, to cuts to supports uh, that people rely on. Actually, Canadians are making cuts to their food. They're cutting back on their standard of living after eight years of this Prime Minister who's not worth the cost. 
Back to that nightmarish report from Food Banks Canada, one Nova Scotian reported to researchers, quote, seniors are having trouble with home heating and many times have to choose between food and heating. Now, with heating, heating bills coming up again soon and a cold winter expected, Nova Scotians will have to pay his carbon tax, which he plans to quadruple. How many Nova Scotia seniors will have to go homeless or hungry in order to pay his massive carbon tax hike? Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Member actually compared about, compared, cared about seniors, he wouldn't have been part of the government that raised the retirement aid, uh, driving seniors further into poverty. We brought it back to 65. We continue to step up with supports for seniors, and we're going to continue to stand and defend their pensions as well. Uh, while his Conservative colleagues are attacking the CPP, uh, he's finally realized that perhaps the CPP is a good thing, has come out in defense of it after a decades, Mr. Speaker, of attacking seniors and their pensions, of attacking attacking the CPP. We're going to continue unequivocally to stand to support seniors right across the country, uh, unlike the Leader of the Opposition. That I have to look this Not only have we always defended the CPP, the number of seniors requiring food banks was drastically lower when we were in government. Now, let me take a quote of British Columbian who uh, reported to the Food Banks Canada report the following. The cost of housing is indescribable. Many of our users are paying 50 percent of their annual income in rent to provide for accommodations if they can find them, end quote. This is the housing hell that this Prime Minister and the NDP have caused after eight years. Will he realize that we don't need more photo ops, we don't need more bureaucracy, we need more homes? Mr. Speaker, as the Leader of the Opposition has put forward no plan for housing, he lacks credibility on this issue. We are taking bold action to get more affordable homes built. Indeed, just today, the Minister of Housing is in British Columbia, is in Kelowna, for our most recent Housing Accelerator announcement, which will streamline building permits and allow for high-density housing near public transit, spurring the construction of up to 20,000 new housing units over the next decade in Kelowna. We're also working with Kelowna to make city-owned lands available for housing in partnership with nonprofits, and we look forward to sign more agreements right across the country delivering for Canadians on housing. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Quebec National Assembly ado unanimously adopted a motion that confirms the economic viability of a sovereign Quebec, one in a series of unanimous motions that speaks for all of Quebec. So, independently of his personal preference, does the Prime Minister recognize Quebec's capacity to succeed economically as an independent country? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Oh my God, Mr. Speaker. The Bloc once again is trying to reopen a uh, squabble on between federal and provincial politics. It's astounding, to be honest. The reality is, yes, of course, Quebecers are proud. They're a proud nation. They're ready to build a better future. But they know full well that this future is best within Canada. And that's why, as a Canadian government, we are here to invest in Quebec, in North Vault, in, in Davies, in lithium mines, hand in hand with the Quebec government to build a better future for all Quebecers and all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Well, you know that enthusiasm, well, we've already heard it before in Quebec, but I'd like to remind the Prime Minister who claims to speak for many people, that unanimously, including the Premier of Quebec, unanimously was it adopted a motion saying that Quebec was capable. I'm not saying if he knows how to count, the Prime Minister knows how to count, or if he likes it, but does he agree with the statement that Quebec can be a sovereign nation, economically speaking? That's it. Simple question. <laughs> The 
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, over the past few years, I've been very pleased to have made announcements hand in hand with Premier Legault, and we have spoken a lot about the importance of uh, reducing the wealth gap between Quebec and other provinces, because we know that Quebec is capable of doing more. Economic growth is here for Quebecers, and we are here to help them and to also benefit as Canadians of our combined economic improvements. And they have shown that they are worthy of this, and we will continue to work with Quebecers in order to build a prosperous future for everyone. Two million Canadians had to use the food bank in one month alone. This is a direct result of Liberals and Conservatives who continue to, to search and distract from what's going on when the real reason of what's, what's causing this, Canadians know really well, when they were asked the question, greedy CEOs. Now, why won't the Prime Minister understand what Canadians already do? Mr. Speaker, we understand and we see firsthand how Canadians are struggling with the cost of food, groceries and housing. That's why we're taking concrete actions uh, to support them through this, whether it be uh, with the grocery rebate, whether it be with $10 a day child care, whether it be with a dental care that's going to support young children, uh, whether it be uh, the initiatives we're taking across this country to create jo good jobs and economic growth, whether it be uh, with the GST rebate checks, whether it be uh, with uh, the the uh, climate action rebate that's putting money in people's pockets right across the country. We're going to continue to be there for Canadians as we had in years past as we lifted hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty, as we've lifted over a million Canadians out of poverty. We know there's more work to do and we are going to continue to do it, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Burnaby South. While well, Liberals and, con and Conservatives continue to distract, Canadians know corporate greed is driving up the cost of food. That's right. Two million Canadians visit food banks. Whilst profits of large grocery stores were close to $4 billion, when the Conservatives and Liberals have a choice, they always, always choose CEOs over Canadians. So the NDP forced them to come back before the committee to answer the questions they refused to ask. Will the Prime Minister admit that his government's approach is a total failure? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, our objective is to make uh, life more affordable and to make sure that companies pay their just part. The Minister for Innovation met CEOs from large grocery chains as well as producers local and international food producers so that we can highlight the necessity in making groceries more affordable. I hope that all members will join us so that we can adopt a Housing Act and Affordable Grocery Act as rapidly as possible in order to improve competitivity in the field. Well, leader of the opposition. It's like a parallel universe every time the NDP leader stands up <laughs> and attacks the very government he's a part of <laughs> and laments how miserable life is for Canadians after two years of him being part of voting for quadrupling the carbon tax, driving up inflationary deficits and, of course, driving two million people to the food banks in a single month. He blames greed for all this hunger. He's right. It is the greed of Liberal and NDP politicians who keep taking more and more from Canadians. Will they reverse these disastrous policies? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. All of us in this House see how Canadians are struggling. We just have different responses to it. The Conservative Party is proposing cuts to government services, cuts to investments that are going to support seniors, cuts to investments that are going to support families, whether it's dental care or child care. The Conservative Party thinks you can cut your way to prosperity when the reality is, Mr. Speaker, our investments in child care, in, uh, in, uh, in dental care, uh, in supports for seniors, in supports for students have actually helped help Canadians through some difficult times and will continue to be there for them into the coming years.
Le rêve chef de l'opposition. Being there for Canadians, he's taking money out of their pockets. And if you don't believe me, listen to the governor of the Bank of Canada, who said, and I quote, today, government spending will be adding to demand more than supply is growing. And in an environment where we are trying to moderate spending and get inflation down, that is not helpful. That adds to the voices of the former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley, who accused this Prime Minister of pressing on the inflationary gas pedal. Will the Prime Minister tell us, does he agree with the bank governor that his government spending is not helpful on inflation? Mr. Speaker, Canadians know we need support and we need more supply on the housing, ri- housing crisis, and that's why we are there investing with municipalities to deliver more housing. In Brampton, our housing agreement will spur the construction of more than 24,000 homes over the next decade. That's an investment that the Leader of the Opposition would cut. In other cities like Rich- Richmond Hill, Moncton and Ajax just this week are passing more ambitious housing plans at their local councils in response to the Federal Housing Accelerator. While the Leader of the Opposition would rip up these agreements, we're focused on building solutions that will work for communities right across the country. The question wasn't about his housing photo ops. The question was about the rate of inflation and its link to government spending. And to quote the Governor of the Bank of Canada on this point today, and I quote, government spending will be adding to demand more than supply is growing. And in an environment where we are trying to moderate spending and get inflation down, that is not helpful. He's now clearly saying that government spending is driving up inflation. So very simple question. Does the Prime Minister agree with the bank governor that deficits are driving inflation? Yes or no? Except, Mr. Speaker, that inflation is steadily coming down, Mr. Speaker. Even as we continue uh, to sign agreements with communities across the country. And by the way, if the opposition leader cared so much about getting more homes built, he would support our Affordable Housing and Groceries Act. This legislation will remove the GST on the construction of rental homes, which housing advocates and developers have described as a game changer. That's the relief that Canadians need. So let's keep moving moving these important measures forward and let's keep getting Canadians the housing relief they need instead of political attacks and cuts, cuts, cuts from the Conservatives. I'd like to remind all members please to uh, wait your turn to uh, take the microphone. I know that some members are very enthusiastic but there are other members who are uh, certainly going to be asking their questions. The Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He's very determined to avoid discussing the growing evidence of of the link between his deficits and the inflation Canadians pay. So let's review what the bank governor said today. He said, one, inflation risks are rising. Two, that inflation won't get back to target until the year 2025, two years out. And three, the bank is now leaving its door open to further rate hikes, probably spurred on by the deficits of this government. With mortgage payments up 150%, For God's sakes, won't he get rid of these inflationary deficits so that Canadians can keep their homes? Mr. Speaker, what the Leader of the Opposition is proposing is to cut spending and supports for Canadians in the hopes that Canadians will somehow do better that way. We disagree. What Canadians need is greater greater investment in supply of housing, for example. That's why, through our agreements, we're unlocking new homes and opportunities for growth in the city of Hamilton by spurring the construction of thousands of homes over the next decade like we are across the country. The Mayor of Hamilton actually said our housing agreement was absolutely a big deal, and I couldn't agree more. When we work together with a strong and ambitious plan, we can get more homes built faster. While the Leader of the Opposition's plan would see these agreements ripped up and stalled, we will keep going forward to help Canadians. You know one word he never used in that big, rambling, uh, red-off answer? done. Because none of those houses are done. They're all promises. But he's been promising to build affordable homes 
for eight years. Since he first made that promise, housing costs have doubled, and none of the promises have come to fruition. Yes, other levels of government have politicians that are thrilled to have more money to bloat their bureaucracies. When will he realize that we don't make housing affordable by building bureaucracy, we have to build homes? Mr. Speaker, we are working hand in hand with municipalities across this country, whether it be Kelowna or Hamilton or Ajax or now Halifax, where we're continuing to move forward with investments that are going to respond to people. And I have to say, I was in Brampton just last week, Mr. Speaker, and as we were making another announcement about new homes coming up, we were standing on the site of a building that we announced two years ago that was opening its doors to new residents today. Mr. Speaker, this is what we are doing. After that member uh, was housing minister who got nothing done, we're there to invest in Canadians and build a stronger future. Honorable Chef de l'Opposition. Mr. Speaker, he has the best photo ops in the history of photo ops. We'll give him credit for that. He wants to know what I got done when I was housing minister. The average rent was $950. It's now over $2,000. When I was housing minister, the average mortgage payment was $1,400. It's now well over $3,500. When I was housing minister, the average needed down payment was $20 grand and you could own a home on average by 29. Now those numbers have skyrocketed. I deal in the world of results. He deals in the world of photo ops. I know which ones Canadians prefer. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, while he continues to insult and slag cities and municipalities across this country, we're going to continue to work with them, like we're working with the city of Halifax to build more homes so locals can thrive in their community. Recently, we announced an agreement with Halifax to fast track 2,600 permitted units over the next three years, spurring the construction of thousands of homes over the next decade. But he wants to talk about what happened when he was housing minister. When he was housing minister, he announced $300 million and got nine. 99 homes built, Mr. Speaker. That's his record as housing minister. We're building homes right across the country. And we're doing it for real, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, it's really important to maintain uh, decorum and respect in this house. So please leave your comments. Leave your comments to the person who's asking the question, and please listen to the comments of the person who's offering the answers. The honourable member for Belle Chambly, Mr. Speaker, the money that the Prime Minister is boasting about spending is Quebec's money, Quebec's taxes. With regards to the motion I mentioned, if he says he agrees, he's in hot water. If he's against, he's in hot water. He's going to be in hot water anyway. Next time he's next to Premier Legault, he will be asked the following question. Why, for once, is he still incapable of just saying what's on his mind? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when I go to Montreal in my riding, when I travel throughout Quebec and I speak to people on their concerns with regards to climate change, to the affordability of life, to the affordability of housing, to the, inter the difficult international situation in which we live, no one talks to me about sovereignty. They, no one talks to me about creating a new country. They talk to me about how we can work together to get concrete results in Quebec. We know that the Bloc Québécois always wants to squabble back to sovereignty, but as proud Quebecers and proud Canadians, we will continue to fight hard for Quebecers and all Canadians.
Let our have deputy be the honourable member for Belo Chambly. I'm like these people. Well, I don't want to talk to him about subjects he doesn't know about. He doesn't want to answer my simple question. So the answer is Quebec can, and Quebec should be independent as rapidly as possible. He can agree, he can disagree, but he can't say that there aren't 125 members of the National Assembly of Quebec who unanimously confirm that Quebec can be a viable country, economically speaking, and that the Prime Minister does not have the spine to say whether he's for or against this motion. I would like to remind the honourable member remind him of what I said last week. It was very important not to question the courage of any member in the House. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, according to the Black Québécois, sovereignty is an urgent matter. They've been here in Ottawa for 30 years, and it's been urgent for 30 years, apparently. They keep trying to bring this to the table. The reality is we have work to do all together to deliver for Quebecers, to deliver housing, to deliver affordable groceries, to deliver a more safe and cleaner planet. That is what we are working on right now, and I work very well with the Quebec government and will continue to do so. We'll put forward the will of Quebecers, that is, to create a better world rather than putting forward the squabbles of the Bloc Québécois. After eight years of this Prime Minister, the inflation is not worth the cost. The Governor of the Bank of Canada stated three things. First of all, inflation risks have increased. Secondly, interest rates could increase again. Thirdly, deficits and expenditures increase government expenditures, increase inflation, and increase the possibility of interest rates being increased once again. Will the Prime Minister finally reverse his inflationist policies before Canadians risk losing their houses? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, it is clear that there is a stark disagreement between myself and the Leader of the Opposition. When Canadians are finding it hard, what he proposes are cuts in services, cuts in uh, assistance and benefits. We will continue to be there for them. The Conservatives will always choose austerity and cuts when times are tough. So longer waiting times in emergency centres, more expensive childcare, uncertainty for retirees and no action against climate change. That is an irresponsible approach and that's what the Conservatives has to offer. We, on our side, will be here to help people. We will invest in their future. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The disagreement isn't with me, it's with the Governor of the Bank of Canada, who today said that government spending increases inflation rates. I know that the Prime Minister loves spending money. He doubled national debt, and now he's forcing Canadians to cut in their own personal decisions. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Governor of the Bank of Canada's report? Yes or no? S government spending increases inflation. Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Contrary to the Leader of the Opposition, we will always respect the independence of the Governor for the Bank of Canada. But as we saw in public accounts, we have reduced deficits without cutting in support that Canadians need. We have the lowest deficit in G7 countries, the best debt-GDP ratio, and we've conserved our AAA rating, and inflation is going down. So we don't need conservative cuts. We can be here responsibly to help Canadians and create growth for Canada. And that is exactly what we are doing. Mr. Speaker, people are already cutting in their personal life because of the 150% increase in mortgage payments, monthly payments since this Prime Minister came into power. People have to abandon their homes, become homeless, or decide to cut 
in the, cut their meals, and that is the reality. Does he agree that this government's deficits increase inflation and inflation rates, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Canadians are faced with a housing crisis. The Conservative solution is to cut in government investments in housing. We have chosen an alternative to reduce the cost of housing. Let us build more housing, and that is exactly what we are doing. Just today, Kelowna will simplify the building permit process to allow better density near transit hubs, which will stimulate the building of up to 20,000 new housing units over the next 10 years. We are here to invest to create better housing, while the Conservatives propose austerity and cuts. Again, with all of his expensive promises that have not completed a single home. He mentions that I spent only $300 million on housing, but he got the number of houses built wrong. It was actually 200,000 homes that were built in the year I was housing minister. But we know that numbers aren't his strength, Mr. Speaker. This is the guy who thinks budgets balance themselves, who doesn't think about monetary policy, who doubled the debt, doubled housing costs, doubled the rent. What else is going to double before this Prime Minister realizes that he's just not worth the cost? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The member opposite knows full well he can uh, look in the history records. Uh, a $300, $300 million program which delivered 99 homes. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to work hand in hand with uh, with uh, municipalities, with uh, community leaders, with nonprofits across the country uh, to move forward on building more homes, on responding to the supply challenges. Uh, that's why, for example, we're removing GST from new apartment buildings. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the members opposite refuse uh, to allow that bill to move forward, are continuing to block it, and uh, they don't want to vote for it either, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be there to support Canadians every step of the way. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The crisis in this country is deeply concerning. People are living in tents, people are living in cars. Now in Saskatchewan, people are resorting to living in apartment lobbies. This is a direct result of Liberals and Conservatives who lost a million affordable homes over the past number of years. Even the Saskatchewan Landlord Association is calling for action. So when will the Prime Minister fix the mess they created and house people this winter? Here, here. Here, here. <laughs> The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Working very closely with municipalities across this country on housing and homelessness, on building more homes, on improving supply. Uh, in the member opposite's hometown of Brampton, our housing agreement will spur the construction of more than 24,000 homes over the next decade by allowing higher, trans higher density housing near public transit. In other cities like Richmond Hill, Moncton, Ajax, just this week are passing more ambitious housing plans at their local councils in response to federal leadership. In Moncton, in Halifax, in Kelowna, uh, in, in other places across this country, we continue to invest in agreements uh, that are going to build more homes quicker to support Canadians and build a brighter future for everyone. Mr. Speaker, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is getting worse by the minute. This collective punishment has now claimed the lives of over 6,000 people. The 12-year-old daughter of one of my constituents remains stuck in Gaza, separated from both her parents, and we have no information on her whereabouts. We need more humanitarian aid and a response that is fair to both Israeli and Palestinian civilians. When will this government join New Democrats in calling for a ceasefire? Fire 
Le Président de la Premier ministre. Monsieur le Speaker, nous unequivocally condamn Hamas' terrorist attack against Israel. We support Israel's right to defend itself in accordance with international law. We are deeply concerned about the situation in Gaza. As I said, there are ongoing diplomatic conversations about consideration of humanitarian pauses, and that is something that Canada supports. Desperately needed humanitarian aid must reach vulnerable Palestinian civilians in Gaza, and Canada is working closely with partners to build a humanitarian corridor. Hamas must immediately release all hostages, and Canadians and foreign nationals who wish to leave Gaza must also be allowed to do so. Mr. Speaker, since it was imposed upon them, Indigenous families and children have experienced racist and discriminatory treatment by Canada's Family and Children Services. Communities in the Yukon and across the nation have always known that self-determination and truth are key to healing and making sure future generations thrive. Thanks to the advocacy of First Nation leaders and communities, calls for accountability have been answered by the highest courts. Can the Prime Minister tell us what the federal court's decision means for First Nation children and families? I thank the uh, Honourable Member for Yukon for his question and his leadership. Yesterday's announcement represents an important milestone. This historic court settlement is the largest in Canadian history and will provide $23 billion to those impacted. While no amount of money can make up for the incredible pain that was caused, this is an important step towards affirming the voices of those affected and our commitment towards reconciliation. It could not have been achieved without the leadership of First Nations, and I look forward to continuing to work alongside them to deliver for Indigenous people across this country. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This Prime Minister is neither worth the cost nor the corruption. We know that he illegally interfered to block the criminal prosecution of a multinational liberal link corporation that had stolen from Africa's poorest people. But now we know that he w was involved in blocking the RCMP from investing the criminality of his conduct. He held back cabinet documents. So we invited the top Mountie to testify on this cover-up, and he and his co-conspirators and the NDP silenced the, the RCMP commissioner and prevented him from testifying. Will the Prime Minister stop the cover-up and let the Mounties testify? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite well knows that both the RCMP and CBSA's Professional Integrity Division are investigating. The CBSA has also launched an internal audit to look into contracting at the agency and has increased oversight processes when it comes to contracting. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, the question was about the SNC Lavalin criminal investigation, not the Rivecan app criminal investigation. I can, I can understand there's so many criminal investigations, <laughs> he can get confused sometimes, but uh, he sure managed to know enough about them to block from any scrutiny. He deprived the police of cabinet documents that may have led to criminal charges against him, and now he's depriving a parliamentary committee from investigating it. The question is, yes or no, will he let the commissioner of the RCMP testify about his blockage of cabinet documents in the criminal investigation of the SNC-Lavalin scandal? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Opposition leader is bringing up matters that were duly settled four years ago. It's obvious that they have no vision for the future of this country, no plan to move Canada forward, and nothing to offer Canadians except cuts, austerity, and partisan attacks. Chef de l'opposition. Well, one thing we will cut is the Arrive Can app. The matter is under also under criminal investigation. It was an, an app we didn't need didn't work and was about 500 times more expensive than it should have been. Yeah. We now know that a one of the contractors that got paid submitted detailed document, documentation on a company that didn't even exist. We know the Prime Minister blocked criminal investigations into his SNC-Lavalin scandal. Will he agree, yes or no, to cooperate with the police in the Arrive Can criminal investigation? Yeah. Yeah. 
le très honorable premier ministre. Mr. Speaker, as I just said to the opposition leader, that when it comes to contracting, investigations are ongoing and processes have been updated. But he doesn't much care about facts or process, just his hidden agenda driven by ideology. An ideology rooted in denying that the government had to act fast in a once-in-a-century moment to keep Canadians safe. He doesn't want to talk about the pandemic. He doesn't want to talk about his behaviour during the pandemic and following it. He will continue to try and distract, deflect, based on his ideology, based on the members of his team. It's very telling that the Conservative Party would choose not to prioritise Canadian safety. He accuses me of distracting. The question was about the criminal investigation into the Arrive Can app. And what does he do? He tries once again to divide Canadians in order to distract from the costs and corruption that he has imposed upon them. So I asked a very simple question. We now know that a program he created is under criminal investigation. Will he, yes or no, cooperate with the police? Mr. Speaker, as I said, both the RCMP and CBSA's Professional Integrity Division are investigating, and the CBSA has also launched an internal audit to look into contracting at the agency. But once again, Mr. Speaker, when the Leader of the Opposition talks about dividing Canadians, he doesn't actually want to accept that over 80 per cent of Canadians chose to get vaccinated during the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. And he continues to play divisive games. He continues to play divisive games to try uh, and divide Canadians on a matter core to public health and public safety. We have always stood up for the safety of Canadians while he chooses to wear a tinfoil hat, Mr. Speaker. I do encourage you once again to take note of my declaration from last week encouraging members to make statements, to avoid the statements which are, uh, qui peut déranger la, uh, les procédures. That could disrupt the proceedings of the House of Commons. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Monsieur le Président, le Premier ministre dit que. The Prime Minister says he will continue to try to maybe consider the priorities of Quebecers. I talked about one of their priorities, which is also a motion for the National Assembly, which is to extend the deadline for paying back business loans. That is representing the survival of thousands of businesses in Quebec and Canada. Does the Prime Minister agree that, in the interest of the economies of Quebec and Canada, need more time or a payment schedule that is more spread out? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We know that small businesses were hard hit by the pandemic and many of them are still experiencing trouble now. The emergency account was an emergency measure. We have announced a one-year extension for repayment. We have made more flexible provisions for those who want to cancel their loans. We will continue to be there for small businesses in Quebec and throughout the country. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. What all businesses are saying, what all the provinces and Quebec are saying, is that this extension is not enough and there's risks of businesses folding. The government may lose more money than it's going to save. So, does the Prime Minister recognize that they need to help businesses more, or does he recognize that, indeed, Quebec should take its own money and manage its own economy independently?
The Red Honourable Prime Minister. Just a little reminder, during the pandemic in Quebec and elsewhere, eight out of ten dollars offered in assistance to Canadians came from the federal government. Small businesses are at the heart of our economy. We were there for businesses during the pandemic and we will continue to do so as they recover. Our financial approach has been responsible and we've offered some leeway to those who want to uh, take advantage of flexibility in the loan repayment program. Chef de the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Wall Street Journal revealed today that mere weeks before Hamas terrorists unleashed uh, the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust, they went to Iran to take training and direction from the terrorist group, the IRGC. Strangely, uh, given that this group is probably the most dangerous terrorist outfit on earth, it is perfectly legal to raise money for it, to organize and recruit for it right here in Canada. Will the Prime Minister ban the IRGC today? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, during the previous Conservative government's uh, attacks and, and rhetoric against Iran, including the closing of the embassy, uh, they never moved forward on banning the IRGC and declaring it a terrorist organization. We know there is a rigorous process to do that. We are pursuing uh, and looking at all options around that. What we did do, Mr. Speaker, is use never before used or rarely before used measures in the immigration uh, uh, department uh, that were used in, in case of war crimes in Rwanda uh, and elsewhere uh, to ban for life member, senior members of the IRGC from ever being able to come and find solace in Canada. That is a strong measure and we're always open to doing more. The same people he claims are banned are present in Canada today. They are terrorizing Persian Canadians. Uh, many Jews feel that their safety is at risk knowing that there are people with links to the world's most dangerous and anti-Semitic terrorist organization legally operating on the ground here in Canada. The Prime Minister has the legal authority embedded in law today with a stroke of a pen to criminalize the IRGC. Will he do it, yes or no? Oh. Mr. Speaker, if I start correcting the Honourable Leader of the Opposition on the facts, we'll be here all day. Uh, the fact of the matter is the listing of an organization as a terrorist organization is actually a meticulous process led by intelligence and security agencies and carefully calibrated uh, to do uh, no harm to Canadians or uh, Canadian military members serving overseas. We will continue to take all measures to hold the murderous regime in Iran to account. We will continue to stand with the community we will stand against anyone who is attempting to harm or intimidate Canadians on Canadian soil. And we are always open to doing more, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are continuing to work on. Before I move on to the Leader of the Opposition, I wish to remind the member for Saint Shore, South Shore St. Margaret's to leave the floor to those who have the floor during question period. Opposition. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Minister has had plenty of time to go through that meticulous process. Under the anti-terror law adapted in the aftermath of 9-11, the Public Safety Minister, which reports to the Prime Minister, has the ability to put groups on the list. There are dozens that have already been added, but the most dangerous terrorist group of all, the IRGC, can still legally fundraise, coordinate, organize and propagate its message here on Canadian soil at great risk to Canadian Jews and Persians. Will the Prime Minister put his intransigence and stubbornness aside and protect Canadians for once and ban the IRGC? Yeah. 
Le traité en arabe premier ministre. Mr. Speaker, we have taken and will continue to take significant actions to hold the murderous regime uh, in, in Tehran to account. We continue to recognize them uh, as supporters of terrorism around the world. We continue to take uh, more tools uh, in terms of doing that, and all options, as always, are on the table. We need to make sure we're doing it in a way that protects Canadians, including Canadians of Iranian descent, but also military uh, members uh, in our CAF serving around the world. Uh, we will continue to do the right things to keep all Canadians safe and hold the, the Iranian regime to account. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our seniors are feeling the effects of inflation. As the opposition wants to cut all the services seniors depend on, and when their party made seniors' lives difficult when they were in power, can the Prime Minister explain to seniors in my riding and across Canada how we have supported them and how we will continue to do so? Thank you. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I thank the member for Dorval Lachine LaSalle for her question and her work with seniors. We are proud of our track record for seniors since 2015. Instead of increasing the retirement age, we decided to keep it at 65. We also increased the guaranteed income supplement. We improved the Canada Pension Plan and increased old age security. Canadians remember the Harper years. That's why we cannot allow them to take that risk. Mr. Speaker, the Americans banned the IRGC in 2019. They reaffirmed, the pre President Biden reaffirmed that decision just last year. The Liberal caucus even voted in this House in favor of banning the IRGC, but the Prime Minister blocked that from happening. He has the legal authority to do it. This is the, the world's most dangerous terrorist group. They help orchestrate the hideous attacks on the people of Israel just weeks ago. Will he finally do the right thing and ban the IRGC? Yes or no? Mr. Speaker, as a leader of the opposition should know, the Americans have a very different regime for us, from us when it comes uh, to banning various organizations. But we continue to have all options on the table. As we've said, we continue to do everything necessary to hold this murderous Iranian regime to account, and we will continue to move forward in measures to do just that. Actually, the regime is really not that different when it comes to listing. We both have a, 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 the power of the executive branch to identify terrorist groups and put them on a list of banned entities, banning them from raising money, recruiting, coordinating, uh, and arranging attacks on uh, other people around the world. That power exists in Canada. And in fact, because the Prime Minister has not been willing to exercise that power using his executive authority, Conservatives have a helpful private members, members bill that would do it for him. Will he adopt the Conservative private members bill to ban the IRGC? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do everything we can to hold Iran, uh, the Iranian regime accountable for its actions. Our actions have included having sanctioned hundreds, over 368, in fact, of Iranian individuals and entities, including the IRGC Quds Force. And we're listing the regime under the most powerful provision of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. We're, of course, working on a way to recognize the regime uh, to continue uh, to be what it is, which is uh, spreading a, regi a regime that spreads terror. And we're working to find a way that doesn't unfairly affect those who may have an association with the IRGC through no choice of their own or puts at risk members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Mr. Speaker, uh, there are plenty of ways to protect people who are unintentionally forced to participate in terrorist groups. That's what we do with all the listed banned terrorist entities that are already on the list. So those tools already exist. The Prime Minister has had eight years, eight years, he is not worth the cost, he is not worth the risk to our safety. Will he adopt the common sense conservative proposal to criminalize the IRGC terrorist group 
today. Mr. Speaker, no one in this House disagrees that Ira the Iranian regime is murderous, is a sponsor of terror, uh, is bloodthirsty against people around the world and indeed against its own citizens. Uh, I remember well uh, having held in my arms uh, families of the victims of PS752 brokenhearted because of what this murderous regime is capable of doing against its own citizens, let alone against citizens around the world. That is why we've continued to pursue every available means to hold the Iranian regime to account to support uh, people fighting for freedom in their country, to support uh, Iranian Canadians, uh, and we will continue to do just that. Before I move on to the member for Davenport, I remind the member from Cumberland Colchester to please uh, allow uh, the question to be answered in the person who has the floor to answer that question without interruption. The honourable member from Davenport. Mr. Speaker. The residents in my riding of Davenport are proud of Canada's unwavering support of Ukraine as it is fighting an illegal, brutal invasion by Russia. The opposition is questioning the need for the important Canada-Ukraine trade legislation that is currently before this House, calling it woke legislation. This puts into question their support towards Ukraine. Can the Prime Minister inform this House how we are committed to supporting Ukraine in their fight for freedom and why this trade legislation is so important? The Honourable Member, sorry, not the Honourable Member for Davenport, but rather the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Davenport for her unflinching advocacy on this important issue. We have been steadfast in our support of Ukraine since day one of Russia's illegal invasion. The modernization of our trade deal with Ukraine is another important area of cooperation between our two countries, which is why it is so disappointing to hear the member that you just called out, the member uh, from Cumberland Colchester, refer to the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement as, quote, woke legislation. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, our support for Ukraine has been unwavering. The leader of the Conservative Party cannot say the same. The, the Honourable Member from Churchill, Kiwatanuk Aski. Mr. Speaker, as the Liberals fails on, fail on climate, First Nations are leading the way. Today's transformative AFN report says First Nations have begun taking matters into their own hands, unable to rely on other governments for robust climate action. What a sad state of affairs in a country as wealthy as Canada. The government insists on paying billions to big oil instead of investing in First Nations, such as those here in Manitoba, on the front lines of the climate crisis. When will this government stop with the billions to big oil, show leadership, and invest in the priorities of Indigenous communities facing the climate crisis now. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Indigenous communities and Indigenous leadership have been indispensable over the past years in our fight against climate change. They've been partners, uh, they've been uh, investors, uh, they've been creators of the moral frame in which we will continue to advance in creating a stronger economy as responsible stewards of this planet. We will continue to work with them and continue to move forward in groundbreaking ways like, for example, the four Indigenous partnerships on protected land that we announced uh, at uh, COP in Montreal, where we demonstrated the kind of leadership that Indigenous people can take in protecting our planet, protecting biodiversity, and building a better future. They are our essential partners, and we are lucky to be working with them. Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, the Gaza Strip is currently being pounded by unprecedented airstrikes, 400 yesterday alone. Nearly two-thirds of Gaza's hospitals aren't functioning, with the remaining running out of power while needed fuel is blocked. In just two and a half weeks, almost 8,000 Israeli and Palestinian civilians have been killed, including more than 2,700 Palestinian kids. How many more children need to die until this government's going to call for a ceasefire? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we unequivocally condemn Hamas's terrorist attack against Israel, and we support Israel's right to defend itself in accordance with international law. 
Of course, we are deeply concerned with the situation in Gaza, and as I said, there are ongoing diplomatic conversations about consideration of humanitarian pauses, which is something that Canada supports. Desperately needed humanitarian aid must reach vulnerable Palestinian civilians at risk in Gaza, and Canada is closely engaged with partners to build a humanitarian corridor. Hamas must release hostages, and we have to get foreign nationals, particularly Canadians, safely out of Gaza. Alas, we've come to the end of question period. I see the honourable member from Edmonton, Sherwood Park, Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan, rising on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In light of the persuasive arguments raised by the Leader of Canada's Conservatives, I hope you will find unanimous consent for the following motion. That notwithstanding any standing order or usual practice of the House, Bill C-350, the Combating Torture and Terrorism Act, be deemed read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs. Absolutely. Yeah. All those opposed to the Honourable Members moving the motion will please say nay. I regret that there is not unanimous consent for this. I see the Honourable Member from Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan rising on another point of order. Chair, is it possible to identify the Liberal Members who said nay in response to the... Uh, the, the Honourable Member is a... Uh, is a uh, as an experienced member of the House, you know that that is not a point of order. It being 3.28, the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recorded division on the motion at third reading stage of Bill C-252 under private members' business. Call in the members.